All righty, Hi Rock, how are we doing this morning? All right. Hope everybody's having a great morning. It's a beautiful day, right? The rain is beautiful, but I hope everybody had a great day yesterday too. I know it was it was nice weather, and I know I'm a little tired from the day because uh, yesterday. All right, see, so we have a family of six. We got three and three. We got three three ladies and three men, and so the ladies were gone yesterday. So I took the boys and we went to the park. All right, and one is nine and one is three. So I chased around a nine-year-old and three-year-old yesterday for about five hours. So, you know, and that's tough. I know at one point I was like, hey, guys, look at that great park bench over there. Let's go play on that thing, right? But eh, they didn't buy it. So, yeah, but it was a great time. So, you know, you got you to gotta enjoy it while it's happening. So everybody had a great morning. But we're glad everybody's here. Uh, we're finishing up a message series called Fight the Good Fight. All right? It's been a four-week series. And in week one, Pastor David kicked us off. Talking a lot about the inner spiritual battle, right? Staying, uh, fighting that battle to, to, to stay in relation with God. Uh, week two, we talked about how we are warriors for God and what that means, all right? And so if you want to listen to any one of those, you can go on to hrclex.life on the website, and you can uh, listen to those on our sermon tab. But last week, so last week we had our outside service, and I mean, I don't know, I had a lot of fun. I hope everybody else did too. It was a great time. Uh, you know, the weather was beautiful. Uh, you know, the message was decent, nah, uh, and, uh, and, but the food was great, good fellowship time, so I had a great time, hope everybody did too, thanks for all the volunteers that helped make that happen, everybody for coming out and supporting us, so that was a good time, and, uh, and, uh, we don't have that recorded, but this Friday, that this past Friday night devotional that we have, uh, I did put about 10 minutes of the message on there, so if you want to listen to some of that, you can go on there and, uh, listen to, you can go on the website and listen to that as well. So today we're going to finish off strong. Okay, like I said, we've been in a message series called Fight the Good Fight. It's been a good growing series, being mindful of the times that we're in and holding on to our Christian character. So today we're going to continue that same spirit, and we're going to finish off strong. And the next week begins our Thanksgiving series, and it's going to be, you know, we're going to look at positive and being thankful and all these good aspects so we can prepare ourselves for the holiday season. So we've got some good stuff coming up. Hope you plan on coming back. All right, so we've been in a book of First Timothy, all right, First Timothy chapter 6 mainly, uh, First Timothy's in the New Testament, it's about, you know, it's pretty much towards the end almost, uh, and and what's going on here, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul was a big church planner, uh, wrote most of the New Testament, uh, he has his protege named Timothy, he's a young guy, he sends him to the church in Ephesus, which is now in modern day China, uh, Asia, okay, and so he sends him there, there's a lot going on. Uh, a lot of spiritual battles, a lot of physical battles. There's a lot of false teachers. Uh, the culture is kind of against God, and there's a lot of arguing going on. And uh, it's kind of almost like our culture today, all right? Uh, seems the, the way the world is spinning. And so really, th uh, this letter could be to any one of us, right? It's challenging him to keep his godly character, to keep pursuing God in the midst of all of this. So really, this letter could be to any one of us today. So today, we're going to be at First Timothy 6. We're also going to look at Look in 2 Timothy as well, uh, chapter 2. All right, so let's get started. In 1 Timothy 6, uh, we're going to look at 3 to, through 10. We've already read a little bit of this, but we're also going to cover some of this that we have not discussed yet. So we're going to discuss it today. So we begin in verse 3, and it reads this. It says, if anyone teaches otherwise, which he's been going through, you know, sound doctrine, you know, teachings of Christ, and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and the godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. So we dissected this a lot in week two about how, okay, there's people saying words, and there's people taking those words, and they're going and quarreling about them, arguing about them, and it's causing the strife, this malicious talk, right? People are arguing. They're, uh, they're saying nasty things to each other, and there's this constant friction between them, right? And uh, that's a lot of what seems to be going on right now in our world, in our culture. You know, there's a lot going on. People are saying words, kind of like an election. That's what happens. Somebody says words. And then people take those words and they go and argue about them and people get nasty and say nasty things. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of hatred going on, especially with different types of things going on. And so there's this constant friction, it seems like, okay? So, so, so that's really why we're discussing a lot of this because 
this is one uh, uh, issue that the Bible wants to try to clear up, and since it's happening now, then we feel like it's appropriate to discuss this now. But so we're going to keep going on and uh, read chat, uh, verse 6. It says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. All right. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, Paul's addressing a lot of issues. It's not just about false teachers, too. He's also talking about uh, there's an issue of contentment. Uh, there's that issue of arguing that we've kind of discussed and we're going to dig into a little bit more today. And there's also an issue of the love of money and what it can do in our lives. So we're going to discuss the arguing and the love of money today because next week we're going to begin our Thanksgiving series with contentment because that's part of being thankful. That's part of being, you know, grateful and joyful is being content, right? You have to be content with what you have. So we'll discuss that a little bit more next week. So we'll talk about those and we're going to start off with the quarreling and the arguing and just dig in a little bit more of that because that's where Paul starts off today. So uh, so he's in these, uh, uh, so, so with the arguing, a lot of what's going on here is Paul's talking about Christian character. He's saying keep your Christian character in the midst of all these things, but it's not just about keeping our character. It's not just about acting. It's about keeping our character based off of our spiritual growth. Right, based off of the disciplines that we have and based off of our focus. So we've already seen in week two, one of the solutions that he has is this. He says, turn away from this godless chatter. Like, don't even be involved in it, right? Turn away from this godless chatter. And his answer to it is uh, verses 11 through 12 says this. But as for you, man of God, flee from these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love steadfastness, gentleness. He tells them to fight the good fight of faith, take hold of this eternal life. He's saying instead of this, flee from these things, don't even get involved, run from them and pursue the spiritual. All right, so that's his answer to this. So now we're going to jump up to 2 Timothy chapter 2, all right, and we're going to start in verses 14 through 17. So obviously these letters were written at two different times, okay? You got 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and 2 Timothy is conveniently located after 1 Timothy, all right? And so these, and so these letters were written at two different times, but I think it's interesting uh, what he says here as we start in verse 14. So he tells Timothy, keep reminding people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value. It only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Kind of sounds familiar, right? He's addressing the exact same issues that he addressed in the first letter. Now he's addressing it in the second letter. So apparently, uh, the people aren't catching on very well. Now, apparently, this, this issue is continuing to spread, right? Apparently, this issue is continuing to keep going. And so Paul feels like he needs to write another letter to, to, to address those issues, and he addresses a few more. So this time, he says the same thing. Do not quarrel about words because he's saying, look, it has no value, right? There is, like, no value in this because he says it, it's only ruining those who listen. So avoid this godless chatter once again, because he says that it will spread like gangrene. So in 1 Timothy, he mentions that it's swerving people from the faith, right? It's taking people away from the faith, and now he's saying that it's leading people into more and more ungodliness. So it only ruins those who listen, spreading like gangrene. I mean, those are some strong words, because gangrene, it's like a body issue, okay? It, it happens in our tissues, and it comes from either lack of blood flow or bacteria, and it starts to deaden the tissues of our, of our body, okay? And, like, I mean, people can lose fingers over this. Uh, they can lose toes, arms, whatever. And so it begins a little bit, and then it begins to spread. So he's saying, look, this quarreling about words is no value. So somebody will hear this, and then and it's ruining the hearer. So somebody gets all upset about something, they start 
causing, you know, malicious talk and strife, and somebody else hears it, so it sparks something within them. They get angry, so they're like, okay, so they feel like they need to rebuttal, and they go off and they tell their friends or somebody they know, and it has the same effect. They're like, okay, yeah, I didn't know that. So they start getting all upset, and they start doing this, and now we're seeing that it's starting to spread like gangrene. And I love it how he used the fact that it happens to a body, because if you think about what the church is, the church is the body of Christ. So it can absolutely happen in Christians and in churches too. You know, we, we come and we spread and we talk and it starts dividing the church of God. And now the church of God is rotting and in threat of losing members because of this issue. That's why he is so adamant about this. And I mean, the imagery that he uses here with gangrene, I mean, look, I mean, how much more does God have to warn us about this? Right? I mean, so we got to be careful because, like I said, our culture is like that. I mean, the election's right around the corner, and things are heating up more and more, and this is happening more and more. We are seeing this in our culture more and more. So we have to be careful over these next few weeks to keep our Christian character. And, and we'll go into a little bit more on why this is so important because we have to remember, you know, it's only ruining those who hear it, and it's spreading like gangrene, and we do not want to be a part of this. We want to be a part of the solution. So part of the solution, as he writes in 2 Timothy here, as we keep reading in verses 22 through 25, he says this, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call all on the Lord out of a pure heart. Sound familiar? Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So his solution to this is the exact same solution he had in the first part of the letter. Pursue the spiritual. Flee from this, right? I remind you again, flee from this. And pursue the spiritual. Fight that good fight. This is part of fighting the good fight of faith. And you can almost hear his tone in this. I mean, he calls these foolish and stupid arguments. And that's kind of heavy language for the Bible. But if you think about it, that's so true. I mean, how many foolish arguments are going on right now? How many stupid arguments are going on right now? And I'm quoting the Bible on this one. So I think this, you know, where he talks about what to do instead, I think this is a little phrase that people should have on their computer screens. I think people should have this taped to their phones or something before we get on social media, before we get involved in these things, especially Christians. But, I mean, a lot of times I think people's motivation is good, right? Like their, their heart's desire is to do what he said. Lead people to repentance and bring them to a knowledge of the truth. However, the way that we go about this a lot of times is, is the exact opposite of the way we need to handle it, right? We're, we're trying to use a negative and trying to get a positive out of it. We're using strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, constant friction. We're using that and thinking that we're going to bring people around to God, but how much is that working? For one thing we have to remember, repentance is God's territory, okay? We don't have the power to truly convict the heart. What we are we are the channels, okay? We are the channels that God uses to bring people to repentance and, uh, and to a knowledge of the truth. So God says, if you want to be used, then you have to be a clear channel. And God says to be a clear channel, this is how you handle it. You must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful, not, not worried about what people said, thinking about it whenever we're not around it, letting it bull and spread and figure out how we're going to, you know, do that rebuttal, try to get revenge. He says, no, don't do that. But opponents must be gently instructed. So that's how we remain the clear channel for God to do our true motivation, which is bring repentance and the knowledge of the truth. You can say, man, but that's tough, right? That is tough, especially in the midst of, you know, the back and forth, to, to still be gentle and to not be resentful. That is tough. Well, that's exactly why it's included in the fight, the good fight. Because fighting the fight is not always about fighting the bad, right? The temptation and the sin. Sometimes doing the right thing is just as much as the fight as anything else is. But 
So, you know, some people might say, well, but if I do that, it looks like I'm losing, right? And they're winning. Well, it depends on what our motivation is. If our motivation is to win an argument, then yes, we're right. We lost. But if our motivation is to truly bring them the repentance into a knowledge of God to, to help save their soul, then if that happens, then we won. See, because the way of the spiritual and the way of the physical are two different things, right? A lot of times the way of the spiritual looks like weakness, but it's like Paul writes. He says, uh, you know, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it's the power of those who are being saved. See, so the message of the cross a lot of times, see, so the spiritual looks like weakness, but it's not. It's really the way of strength. Because, because if, our true, if our true motivation is to bring them to God, is to bring them closer to God, then it doesn't matter if we look like we're winning or losing. If the end result is to bring them to God and that happens, then we've won. See, then we've won. So it doesn't matter how we get to that point. And that's why I think Paul was really driving this point home because it's not about winning arguments. It's about winning souls. And if we're going to win souls, we have to do things God's way. Because really what we're doing is we're combating things of this world that take people away from God and his truth. And that's why he brings in the next example that we're going to go into. And that is back to chapter uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And that is money. That's the love of money and the root, right? That, because they're... At first, there's a surface-level thing about money, but once we really start digging into it and we see the true purpose of this, then we see the, the, you know, why it's so important. So as we flip back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, we'll read it, then we'll talk about it. It says, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation in a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So once again, here's another issue that is having people wander from the faith and piercing themselves with many griefs. So Paul was wanting to address this as well because this is an issue. He's saying that people are using godliness as a means of financial gains. They are letting money take them off their walk with God. It's distorting their perception, and now it's inhibiting their walk with God. So we're going to uh, uh, dig into this. The one thing it says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. All right, so this is probably the most misquoted verse in the Bible because the, the phrase now is money is the root of all evil. That's not what it says, okay? Money is not the root of all evil. Money is simply a piece of paper or a coin. It has no value. We are the ones who give it its power. We give money the power because it's how we look at it, right? It's how we view it. So it, because it says people have pierced themselves with many pains. When he says pierce themselves, that means something that we are doing to ourselves, right, by giving money its power. So we have to be careful how much we let money not only control us, but also control our walk with God. Because it can actually do that because it can set that root in. It can set that root in. And a lot of times we think that it's the spending of the money that's the problem. You know, like if we spend our money on something wrong or something bad, it's going to affect our life negatively. Sure, it absolutely will. But also, too, sometimes it's the not spending of the money that gives us a negative effect as well. Like I said, we think God, you know, we think, okay, well, God says, you know, don't go on the internet and do these things, or you know, don't, uh, you know, don't, don't invest in this. Uh, don't do this too much, and it takes money to do it. So if we're spending our money on these things, God's like, hey, look, you don't want to do that. It's going to have a negative effect. Then yes, if we spend our money on it, then yes, it's going to have that negative effect. But if God says, hey, look, I need you to spend your money on that, right? Because it ain't always about not spending money. Sometimes it is about spending money. God says, I need you to spend money on this. And we say, no, God, I can't. That can have the exact same negative effect in our lives as well. Sometimes maybe even worse. Because he says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So what does that mean, right? How does that form a root that can have all kinds of evil? All right. So say in our lives, right, we're making leaps and bounds in some areas. Okay, it could be a temptation or it could be some type of self-denial or say, you know, we, 
you, you know, we're trying not to say curse words, or we're trying not to gossip, or we're trying not to, you know, do unhealthy things in our lives, right? We have all these things. We're like, okay, I'm going to hunker down. And I'm going to do these. So, so we do. So we go and we pursue this, and we and we invite God into the situation, right? We make these leaps and bounds in these areas of our lives, and we're doing good. But we also have to realize that the areas of our lives that we neglect can can affect the ones that we're doing well in. Because what happens is, see, when God says, you know, let's do this, and we say, no, God, I can't or I won't, then we have to harden our heart to the Holy Spirit's conviction in that area. So whenever we say no, then what happens is we're, we're starting to have lack of faith and trust because, see, it's the good fight of faith. And faith is, is rooted in a word that, that means trust, okay? So really it's about trusting God is what this is. So if we have an area of our lives where we're not trusting God and we're saying no, what that does is that forms this root within us. So, so if it comes down to the money and God says, hey, look, you know, uh, let's talk about spending money, right? Let's try to do this. Okay, let's try to do that. And we're like, no, God, I can't. What that does is that forms a little root inside of us that has lack of faith and trust to God, and it has a spirit of, of disobedience attached to it. So now we're starting to form this root. And the more that we do that, the root gets bigger and bigger. So now we have these areas of our lives where we've, where we've done so well in, but eventually we're going to start, you know, wanting to fall back into our flesh. We're going to start wanting to go backwards. But, and if we already have this root of, of lack of faith and trust in God, if we already have this root of spirit of disobedience within us, then the enemy and our flesh can use that in the areas that's going on as well. So now we have a root that is forming all different kinds of evils. See how that works? So we have to be careful in this area. And it's not just with money that this root forms, right? It could be with, uh, you know, I've seen people who, who get caught in like pornography, you know, and they're doing so well. But this, you start seeing this downward spiral in their faith because they can't get over that and it just overtakes them. Well, I think Paul uses the example of money here with that root to, 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 to show that root that can happen to other things. I think he uses money here because that's the biggest hang-up that people have. That's the number one thing where people are going to say, no, God, I can't, God. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do it, God. And, and that's the number one thing. So Paul's using that as a thing to say, look, be careful in this area because you think it's not happening. You know, you think it's not causing that much of a problem, but later on down the road, we're going to start seeing that come into play. So, so that's how that is. And so, yeah, I mean, it has formed a lot of root of evil. And I mean, there's, and I think there's kind of like the stigma in the, in the church world today that this root plays into. Because, I mean, you know, whenever churches start talking about money, it could be probably a little awkward. You know, I mean, it can be a little awkward and some people get upset about it. Um, I think it's just a part of our natural flesh, right? You know, it's like, it's just, it's just part of stuff that happens. And sometimes, you know, the pastor feels awkward and he's dancing around and he's apologetic and the people are upset. And I mean, this needs to be dropped, right? This, th th this stigma, this root that money has caused in the, in the church world globally, I mean, I mean, it really needs to be dropped. And I'll tell you my, my example of this, okay, my story about this, uh, 12 years ago is when I really started pursuing God, okay? And I started getting back into church again. And, and I didn't know anything from anything. I didn't know where a book in the Bible was. I never dreamed of being a pastor. All I know is that I needed God more than anything, and I was going to seek him more than anything, and then I was going to help out whatever I needed to do because people told me, you got to get involved. You got to have a living and active faith. So I, went, I was going to about three different churches at the time, and I was wanting to help. I was wanting to seek God, okay? And so I did. But then, whenever it came down to this money thing, it's like I had the same kind of thinking, right? Churches started asking for money, and I was like, oh, man, there you go, right? Going to a church, and here they are. You know, they're asking for money. And, uh, you know, that kind of hung out for a while. I'm not going to lie. But then as I started pursuing God, right, I was, as I started learning more about it, as I started researching, I started realizing a few things. One is the fact that it's not about church and money. It's about trusting God with something that's inhibiting my life, right? And so that's one thing. The next thing I've started realizing is, is that I want to go to a living and active church. I want my church to be, to, 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 to be out in the community. I wanted them to be helping people. Well, churches run off of donations. And so if I want a healthy and active church, then I have to be a part of that. You know, I can't sit in a seat and not give my time and give my money and then look at my church and say, why aren't you doing anything? 
See, so I had to be a part of that process too. So I had to volunteer my time and I had to trust God with my resources so that my church could help people that really needed it. And three, the biggest hang up in people's lives are money. Okay. Like now being a counselor and stuff, I really see this played out. Okay. The biggest hang up people have in their lives are money. The number one cause of divorce are money issues. Okay, so when divorce happens, think about the children, right? Think about families who are being torn apart. So money's the number one thing tearing families apart right now, okay? What's the number one idol people have besides God and replace God with? Money. What's the number one thing people put their hope and their faith and their trust in besides God? Money. So here it is. You got the number one idol people use to replace God. Okay, you got the number one thing tearing families apart. You got the number one thing that uh, you know, people struggle with is money. So if a church doesn't talk about it, how much of a disservice is the church really doing its people? That's probably why that's the number one thing Jesus talked about more than anything. It wasn't because he, he wanted the money or needed the money. It's because he knows the biggest hang-up for his people. So why wouldn't he talk about it like that? It's the same way with the church. That's what I'm saying. So when the churches talk about stuff like that, you know, honestly, you know, the people's reaction, man, doesn't need to be all gosh or shut down or, or close their ears off. It, okay, that's a part of the deal, right? And, and am I really applying what they're telling me to do? Are they really applying what they're telling me to do? And another issue I think in the church world revolved around this, honestly, is the unrealistic expectation that people put on tithing. Because tithing is 10% of our income, okay? And that's, and that's a lot. I don't know about you, but, you know, 10% of my income, you know, I, I need that. But, you know, I think a lot of times people think, well, if I can't give 10%, then I can't give anything at all, right? And it's not doing, I'm not doing as good as everybody else is. And sometimes I've heard that if you're not giving 10%, you're just tipping God. And I think that's wrong because no matter what we give to God, I mean, that took sacrifice. That took dedication. You know, that took trusting God. And so for somebody to say, look, if you can't give 10%, you're not doing as well as that person over there, that's not what the Bible says. Okay, Paul talks about giving to our sacrificial level. So it doesn't matter, you know, what we're giving. It's the fact that we started that giving. It don't matter if it starts at a dollar. It doesn't matter if it starts at $5, right? We have to start some. Somewhere because we have to break that root that is causing all forms of evil in our life. We have to take, you know, the spiritual shovel and start digging that root out. And the only way we're going to start digging that root out is by doing something towards giving. Because I did the same thing. I started off with $5 and I plateaued at 20 for a long time. And then, and I got into a situation where I absolutely had no money. No money. I had a bag of change. And I was looking at it, I'm like, how am I going to make this bag of change last? And a thought came in my head. I said, that change is not your hope. I am. Talking about God said that. So I said, okay. So I walked in church that Sunday, and I poured all that change into the offering box. And I said, okay, God, here it is. And my bills were paid, and everything happened. I didn't know how it happened. I didn't want to know how it happened. All I knew was God provided. And I tell you what, I've been tithing ever since. You couldn't pay me not to tithe. But. But I started somewhere else. And that's my point, is that to break that root, we have to start somewhere. And so, yes, I went into all that because, like I said, churches need to address that issue because it's not about the giving. It's about the trusting God, and it's about breaking that root and being able to expose the lie of the enemy, you know, which is the I can't. I can't, God. Because Paul goes into these two issues about the, uh, about the arguing and the quarreling, and he really digs into it almost to the point where we're like, okay, okay, I get it, right? We're talking about this. I get it. Well, do we really get it? Because if we're still doing it, then we don't get it. And then he talks about the, uh, the money issue and the root that it's causing and, and how it's really affecting their spiritual lives. It's the same as everything else. So he goes into this because there's a bigger play at hand, right? There's something bigger. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he, he starts summing this up. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, he says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. 
That's such a great reminder because the last days, and the last days are coming. Right now, all the prophecies have been fulfilled for Jesus Christ to return in his first coming, okay? All we're waiting on is him to come. So there's a, so there's a bigger picture spinning here, and that bigger picture is eventually earth is going to end, the agreement of the gospel is going to end, and you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. And that's the reality of it. So, if that's the big picture, what he's saying here, he is troubleshooting things in our lives that keeps us from being the soldiers, keeps us from being the warriors, keeps us from being sold out for the kingdom, right? Keeps us for, from building our relationship with God, things that we need to do because if we're Christians and we understand the reality, and sure, we're saved, we're going to heaven, we're good, but what about our families? I mean, what about our friends? What about our coworkers? It's not going to be fun as we step into heaven and watch people we love plunge into hell. That's my biggest fear is that people I love are going to go to hell. And here I am, a Christian with the gospel, the message of hope. Am I holding it from them? And that's what he's saying here. Don't be so wrapped up in yourself that it... You know, you start debating somebody that you get mad, that you start doing the malicious talk, that you start doing these things, right? Don't do that. Be, be able to teach, man. Don't get resentful, right? Hold your cool, man. Hold your tongue, right? Keep your Christian character in the midst of all this because you want this person to go to heaven, right? So that's the bigger picture. Don't get so wrapped up right now. Have that eternal thinking to where if God says, look, I need you to go here. I need you to say this and say they come back at us, right? We can keep our cool because we know that there's a bigger picture involved. Even the same with the love of money. You know, ministry takes donations, yeah. So if God says, hey, look, you know, I want you to give um, um, $100 to this ministry, $50, whatever it is, right? We've already started that momentum to where we can say, okay, God, I trust you, right? It's not all about me. Sure, I cannot eat out two, two times this week. That way somebody else can come to know Christ. Or if he says, look, I want you to give uh, ten dollars to this man but don't just give him ten dollars use that as a means to talk about me but if we don't have if we still have that i can't attitude when it comes to money then how many opportunities are we going to miss because we said no i'm not giving a dollar i'm not giving five dollars to this person god i can't and so we've missed all those opportunities to talk about people because we have not dug into that root that forms all kinds of evils in our hearts yet but, but, but to be able to do this, to truly throw that, you know, spiritual punch, so to speak, right, to truly be able to get into the world and to be effective for Christ, it all begins in our personal lives. And that's why, even though he talked about all these different issues, contentment, false teachers, love of money, arguing, all these things that we seem to be different, the answer was all the same, pursue the spiritual. Pursue the spiritual first. Pursue God. Pursue his righteousness and his kingdom, and all these things will be added to it, right? It all begins, and that's where our foundation comes from. That's where our foundation comes from and our momentum. Because, yes, we've been talking about fighting a good fight, and we've had the boxing gloves up there, okay? And I did some boxing. I've done some amateur MMA, uh, whatever, no big deal. But when it comes to throwing a punch, right, when it comes to fighting, people think a punch comes from your hand, right? It just comes straight from your hand. Well, it doesn't. A punch delivers energy is all it does. Your hand delivers energy because your punch starts in your foundation. It starts in your feet, and it goes up through your foot, through your hip. It comes up through your shoulder, and everything comes out. And all that does, all that does is deliver what started down here in your foundation. That's why when you see boxers, they're always moving. They're trying to get angles because you don't want your boxer's feet to get planted because if you do, he's going to knock your block off, right? That's where his power comes from. That's why you want your enemy to keep moving. You want to keep doing angles because he can't get settled because he gets settled, and he's going to hit you harder. And it's the same way with our spirituality. See, we want to wait to the moment of temptation to say, okay, I got this, right, to deliver that punch to an enemy. We want to say, okay, I'll wait till he says it to do this. No, no, no. It begins in those small spiritual pursuits, right? It begins to fight the good fight like Pastor David talked about in week one. It begins in the Bible study in the morning. The, the true fight is dedicating our lives to God and our personal lives, which nobody else sees but, him, but, but us and God, that 
waking up early in the morning to seek God, to read the Bible, to pray, to feel His presence, right? That's the real fight. That's, our, that's where our foundation comes from. It's praying to God in our heart. You know, it's doing these things that nobody else can see, and that's where our foundation is, and that's how we truly deliver this punch, right? That's how we truly have this momentum. So that way when God says, hey, look, I, you know, I want you to do this for me, we can say, okay, because we've got a good foundation, we've got a lot of momentum, and now we can truly get out into the world and do these things. That's why, that's why we start with a dollar. And then once we do a dollar for a little while, we start with $5. Then we go to 10 so that way when God says, hey, look, you know, I want you to do this for me. I want you to help this person out. We've already got that foundation of giving. We started breaking that root. So now when God says, hey, you know, try this for me, we say, okay, God, I've got that foundation. I've got some, some you know, I've got some, some a momentum. So, yeah, no problem. And that's the bigger picture here. That's the bigger picture. Having that foundation with God, pursuing righteousness, pursuing love, pursuing God in our personal lives, and it comes out in our action, and those are true actions. So, yes, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. There's a lot going on right now. We can put our energy into our own personal spiritual lives, and instead of jumping into the world and doing like everybody else and, and causing gangrene, right, causing this rot between people, we can be different. We can be world changers. We can be game changers. We can keep our cool. We can give. We can show love. We can help people go to heaven. Because we've chose to fight the good fight. And that's a matter of the heart. That's a matter of the heart. So in a minute, you know, we're just going to sing about coming to the altar. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you come up to the altar here. The altar's in our hearts. The fact of the matter is, is that we humbly approach God honestly and say, God, you know what? I'm struggling in this area of my life. I'm not there yet. I want to break that root today. It doesn't matter if it's money. It doesn't matter if it's temptation. It doesn't matter what it is. It's the fact that we approach God humbly in our heart. We say, okay, God, I'm struggling. I need your help. I want to fight this good fight. And it begins with you. And not just that, I know I'm not alone in my fight. And just like with Christ, the gospel, the fight begins by believing in Jesus Christ. Believe in the gospel that he is the Lord and he did come, live on this earth a perfect life. He, he lived that perfect life. He died on the cross for us, taking our sins. He was buried, rose again. Three days later, and the Bible says we believe that in our heart, we confess that with our mouth, then we are saved, and that's where the battle is truly won. It's by believing in Jesus and going to him in repentance. So whether we're a Christian or whether we're not, it all begins going to the foot of the cross, humbly and asking for repentance and forgiveness. Let's go, uh, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your, for your dedication to us, God. Father, we thank you so much for, for one, Lord, for fighting the good fight for us. For fighting the battle that we cannot win, the battle of sin, the battle of where we're going to spend eternity at. Jesus, you won that battle. But Jesus, I pray, God, that we can jump on board with your kingdom. Help build your kingdom, God. We can see the deeper spiritual matters of what's going on today. It's not just about arguing over a movement or arguing over politics, Lord. It's not just about going and, and being right and having this constant friction, Lord. Those are distractions, God, from the true matter of the heart. It's about us being sold-out officers in your army. It's about us having a commanding officer named Jesus Christ who has given us instructions to follow. That way we can be sold out for you and we can be game changers and we can help you save people, God, because you want people to come to repentance. You want people to come to a knowledge of you, and that happens through you, Lord. So let us seek your face today to see what your will is for us, to see what our orders are, our marching orders are, so that way, God, we can truly be effective for your kingdom. 
God, help us get rid of these roots that are within us, God. Roots of bitterness. Roots of lack of faith and trust. Roots of dis- this disobedience. And whatever, whatever area of our life it is, God, whether it's, whether it's uh, temptations or whether it's the way we speak, whether it's anger, anger, Lord, or whether it's money, help us make the steps to be able to overcome that today, God. And that's fighting the good fight. And it all begins with you. So if there's anyone today, Lord, that is not a believer in you, God, that is tired of fighting life on their own, that feels like they are at, at, at their end and, and are defeated, let us give our hearts to you, God. They can say something like this. If that's you today, you can say, God, I need you in my life. I believe in your son, Jesus. So, so Jesus, I, I believe you lived the perfect life. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe that you rose again. I, I, I give you my heart today. Forgive my sins. I want to be yours. And God, even today, even if we've been a believer, Lord, and we're struggling, it's still the same route to humbly crawl to your cross. Be honest. God, I'm struggling. Help me to have trust in you. Help me to start waking up in the morning and and feeling your presence. Help me to watch my mouth as I talk. Help me to start trusting you today with giving, Lord. Because I want to be sold out. I want to fight for you. So as we worship together, let us crawl to the cross in our own personal battle and be honest with Jesus and surrender and repent. We thank you for this opportunity, God, and we love you. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.